Well, let's look together this evening at Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30, and look together at the faith that finds freedom from misery. The faith that finds freedom from misery. And it's an unexpected faith, but it's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're continuing in Mark's Gospel, and you know well that in the first verse, John Mark outlines what he's writing about. He's writing about Jesus, the Christ, who's also the Son of God. It's the good news of who Jesus is. And the first thing I'd like you to notice this evening is that that Gospel, that good news of Jesus, is for all. We're a week from the carol service. We have a Christmas message. We have an Easter message too. And it's for all. Be bold and prayerful as you invite. Because the good news of Jesus is good news for all, especially, it seems to me, in the unexpected. Wouldn't it be marvellous if we remember the carol service 2022 as the unexpected carol service? Not unexpected because we sang some different carols, because that's what folks want to sing when they come in. They want to hear the old readings. But would it be marvellous if the people here were unexpected? And it went down in 2022 as the unexpected carol service. It's good news for all, especially the unexpected. And we notice that from the contrast and the continuity here in Mark's Gospel. There's a contrast to what's come before, but there's continuity too. Let's look at them both. First of all, the contrast, which is glaring and glorious. The last encounter, you remember, was with the Pharisees and the scribes, finding fault with Jesus' disciples because they weren't washing their hands. They weren't going through the traditions of men to be cleansed. Jesus deals with them. He dealt with a crowd. He then dealt with the disciples. And he does that very much on home territory, at the Sea of Galilee, possibly Capernaum. That's where we were last time. But as Mark moves his gospel on, we're now 50 miles northwest. I meant to have a map, I'm sorry. We're moving tonight 50 miles northwest to Tyre and Sidon, right on the coast in modern-day Lebanon. It's the furthest recorded distance that Jesus travelled in his public ministry. So he's moved from near to far, from home to very much away. And he's moved into Syrophoenicia. He's moved across the border. The borders of Israel, even in the glorious days of David and Solomon, never extended this far. This is beyond, the back and beyond. It's over the border. In Old Testament language, this is Jezebel's land, the wife of wicked Ahab. This is hostile territory. This is the land of the enemy. And here, Jesus meets with this nameless Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile. Unlike his previous audience, she has no religious credentials whatsoever. All that brings her to Jesus is a desperate need. She's rather like the lady who lives hundreds of years before in the same place, the widow of Zarephath. Same place. Same desperate need. A son who was sick and then died, of course. So what on earth is Jesus doing having moved from here to up here? Well, we're told in verse 24 that he arose. It's a very strong word. It means a decisive action. I would guess that he moves to get away from the wearing opposition of the religious leaders. We're told in verse 24 he wanted his presence to be a secret. Verse 24 is sometimes referred to as the aborted retirement in Syrophoenicia. It seems to me that since chapter 6 and verse 31 he's been calling his disciples to have a rest and they haven't been able to have one, they've been interrupted. So I would argue that he's probably here looking for a a rest from the opposition of the religious leaders. So he goes to a place of opposition. Because wherever Jesus goes, he's going to be opposed. But wherever Jesus goes, he finds 
and he ministers to need. It's another extraordinary account of Jesus going miles and we only record one incident where in his mercy he deals with a, a nameless pagan who's got a demon-possessed daughter. And that's the kind of saviour that Jesus is. You see, the key contrast here is that faith is found in somebody most unexpected. The privileged religious Jewish leaders, the biological children, verse 27, with all their religious advantages, have found fault with his disciples. And this dear woman from the back and beyond, his name we don't even know, comes to Jesus in faith because she's got a desperate need. Matthew points out in chapter 15 that she calls him the son of David. But she's a Syrophoenician. She's got no rightful claim on the, the Jewish Messiah. But she comes. And that's what you ought to notice. The unexpected faith in an unlikely character, in the back and beyond. And it makes me wonder in what unlikely character and shape shed the back and beyond might we find unexpected faith even this Christmas time? That unexpected family neighbour, that friend, that person that you find it most difficult to get on, the person that you think is least likely ever to come into this building. What it would be like the Syro Syrophoenician lady coming to Jesus. Who can tell? That's the contrast. But there's continuity too. And you say, well, how can there be continuity? Well, what did we look at last time? Well, last time it was clean and unclean. Food and other religious ceremonies or the cleansing of the human heart by Jesus' blood. Yeah. Well, it's a continuing theme then, isn't it? Is it? Yes. Why? Well, she's a Gentile, verse 26, considered to be unclean, first of all. She's a Greek. She's a pagan, and what's worse, she's got a daughter with an unclean spirit. An unclean Gentile with a daughter with an unclean spirit. I mean, this must have been a stuff of nightmares for the Pharisee. They must have been wanting to run a million miles. The question again is how to be cleansed? Who can cleanse the demon possessed daughter? And that's the question who? And you know the answer. I don't really need to tell you. And so the chief lesson, really, of this passage is the good news is for all. The offer of salvation, of cleansing from our sin by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is for all. It really is for the lost and the last and the least. I mean, I mean who is cleansed here? Upon whom is the miracle worked here? It's the daughter, isn't it? It's the daughter of the pagan woman who goes to Jesus and prays to him that her daughter will be set free from her misery. And is it not a special focus of the scriptures that it is to the lost and the last and the least that the Saviour delights to go to? I mean, it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. God calls not many wise or mighty or noble he chooses the foolish, the wise, the despised things. I mean, Jesus was the friend of tax collectors, wasn't he, and prostitutes, and women who were so badly degraded in their time, and Gentiles. I mean, he's a glutton and a drunkard. <laughs> but it's as though the Saviour just gravitates to sinners. The good news is for all. And we've got these lovely little invites for the carol service here. And I was just thinking for you know, one or two of us, it might just be a, a prayer to give to one person. Maybe the most unexpected person. Or maybe you fancy putting a few through a door or knocking on half a dozen doors. Or maybe you fancy 20 minutes having a cup of coffee around at Leo's and just handing half a dozen out when you come out. Or maybe you fancy just walking around the street for half an hour and just saying hello to somebody, an unexpected character, and give them an invite. The good news really is for all. It was and is for the Jew first, as Jesus makes plain here. He simply establishes his priority. 
but it includes others, and in fact, all of us. It's to the Jew first that Gentiles are included. There are children and there are little dogs, of whom we'll deal later. Jesus said in Matthew 10, don't go the way of the Gentiles to his disciples early on in their mission. He said, don't enter a city of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When the Apostle Paul writes Romans, he says in the first chapter, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto the salvation of everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. Jesus' mission was first to the Jew, but the gospel is for everyone. I wonder if there's anyone who comes to your mind this evening, and if you're honest, the self-righteousness and Pharisaism which lurks in your heart, as I can assure you it lurks in mine, thinks it won't be for them. It'll never be for them. And if you think that, then you're absolutely wrong. Because it's for everyone. It's for the Jew first, but it was always for the Gentile too. Genesis 12, verse 3 in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All those Old Testament texts about the alien, the foreigner, all the nations, the end of the earth, the suffering servant being a light to the Gentiles, Isaiah 42, 6. There was a foretaste even in Syrophoenicia, wasn't there, with the widow of Zarephath. Remember all those years ago that Jesus mentions in the synagogue in his hometown in Luke chapter 3? And what's the response there of the religious people when he mentions the Gentile that Elijah visited? They are furious. We have to beware our own prejudices, don't we? You know, if so-and-so came, would we feel uncomfortable? If so-and-so came, would we feel uneasy? Would we be a, a tad embarrassed? Might we be furious even in our heart if so-and-so was saved? All these thoughts should be a million miles from our hearts, but they really are... The gospel is for all. And that's seen here in this glorious woman. Because at this point in the gospel, well, Jesus is, let's take a, a summary, he's rejected by the religious leaders. He's doubted by his family. He's followed by crowds for the wrong reason. He's followed by a bunch of disciples who struggle to understand. He's recognised by evil spirits. And he's trusted implicitly by this desperate pagan mum. And that's why in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, Jesus commends her for her faith. Beware of our prejudices. The good news, cleansing of sin is for all. All are unclean of heart, not on account of race or any other category but merely on the basis of an unclean heart. The good news is the cleansing of the sin of all, even the self-righteous, even you and me. We're supposed to be staggered here that, you know her from so-and-so? Well, she's just turned up and she's come to Jesus. The second thing is the background to her situation. And in some ways, there's not that much difference between her background and the background of our family, friends and neighbours. Because secondly tonight, I want to look at the misery of darkness and uncleanness. And we see that first of all in the woman. She's a Gentile. And as we'll see in a few moments, she acknowledges her own uncleanness. Not because she's a Gentile, but because she's an unworthy sinner. She knows that, as we'll see. But what drives her to Jesus is the misery of the state of her daughter, who has, verse 25, an unclean spirit, referred to as a demon in verses 26, 29, and 30. Now, we have problems, don't we, in the West, I think, because we're doubtful about the invisible. We are very proud of our materialistic worldview. We tend to regard ourselves as too sophisticated to believe in what we label as primitive, <laughs> demons. 
Yet here they are again in the word of God. And just think for a moment that in the West, I mean, the devil is overtly worshipped by some. Lyrics, art, films are littered with references to dark forces. You sometimes hear about them in reports of trials. There's a damaging and forbidden interest in the occult, contacting the spirit world. There's an inconsistency in the West, isn't there? Oh, we're too sophisticated for all of this, but we still go in for it nevertheless. And what the Bible teaches and the Christian believes is that there is a wicked force of evil spirits in the world <coughs> called demons who were once holy angels but have now fallen. And they follow the proud rebellion of their leader, Satan. In the future, they will be thrown into the lake of fire where they will be tormented forever. But such a one possesses this daughter here. And doubtless leads to a tormented life, a tragic life, a life of misery, both for her and for her care, her dear old mum. And we're not told how it worked out for this girl, but we are for others in the scripture. It might have resulted in her being thrown into a fire. It might have resulted in her suffering from severe convulsions. For her and for her mum, well, her mum would have been hard-pressed. It would have been hard work. Every day there would have been the emotional stress. She'd doubtless have got down. She'd have known times of great misery. Perhaps she'd have been stigmatised. Perhaps it was her fault that her daughter was like she was. Perhaps people would have crossed the road to ignore them. Perhaps they were an isolated family because the daughter was demon-possessed. You can imagine it, can't you? A poor, wretched, miserable mum and a daughter. And there will be many miseries within families in the town of Shepshed this evening. Not sure that any of them will be because of demon possession, but the Bible paints a similar picture of misery, doesn't it? Of, listen, of all who remain in unbelief. That despite the gloss and the show and the lights and the money being spent on Christmas... They're truly harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd. They're trying to make the best. Was it Ian Harrison once who stood in the pulpit at Kirk Hill and said, these people are just trying to make the best of death? It was Ian. They're just trying their very best to make the best of death. I wonder if we'll humbly own that truth and seek compassionate hearts this Christmas. The daughter here is an extreme example, but Christmas, the, the, the scripture's clear, and we need to wake up to this spiritual reality that we're all under the influence of the forces of darkness until we're converted. John says the whole world is under the sway in the lap of the evil one. Now just think about your family, your loved ones, your friends, your neighbours, your friends in the classroom, people on the bus, queuing up at the co-op. The whole world is in the lap of the evil one. There's a global spiritual influence which explains the state of the world and the state of this town. Paul says the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I ask you again tonight to picture those who've been on your mind so far tonight. What's true of them? Well, the God of this age has blinded their minds. Or as Paul says to the church at Ephesus, we were all following the ways of this world at one time, the roar of the kingdom of the air. The spirit is now at work. Now at work in those who are disobedient. That's the Christian's testimony of what they were like before conversion. And it's the unbeliever's testimony today. The gospel was preached, Acts 26, to turn people from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's the purpose and the power of the gospel. Because men, women and young people here in Shepshire need to be turned from the power of Satan to God. And there's only one way to do that, that's to preach the gospel to them. When Paul reviews the lives of the believers there at Colossae, he says, he has delivered us from darkness. And he's conveyed us 
thrust us into the kingdom of the Son whom he loves. And that's not true of the unbelievers on your heart and mind this evening. They are still in that dominion of darkness. As you think of them tonight by birth, they're under Satan's cruel dominion as we all are, held captive and slaves awaiting condemnation. And we're the only ones with good news that Jesus only can set us free. The good news of Jesus is for all. All are in need of its message and its freedom. All are held in a dark and miserable captivity. This is the real background which exists, in which we're looking to God that we might find unexpected faith. Let's thirdly and briefly look at that unexpected faith in this woman. Because it's the key, in a sense, isn't it? It's certainly the key link for a daughter. Can you imagine the daughter's testimony you know, down the line? Uh, well, it was me mum. She had faith in this carpenter's son from Nazareth. I'm not saying she was a brummy, but she might, might have thought like that. <laughs> you know, I, I can't believe it, you know. My mum just believed in this carpenter's son from Nazareth. It just seems so foolish, but I can tell you it's marvellous. And her marvellous faith is demonstrated throughout. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 28, O woman, great is your faith. And I encourage us all to think tonight, we're all in this background of darkness, this reality. We've all heard the message of hope. Are we a people of faith? And is our faith in the message of hope? Let's look at six things very briefly about her faith. Number one, it's in Christ alone. Clearly her hope is only in Jesus. She applies only to him. It's a great illustration of that. She's not hedging any bets, is she, by going to half a dozen different people. She goes to Jesus. She puts all of her eggs in one basket. That's not a bad way to think about faith. <coughs> And so it is in salvation, being made right with God once and for all. We're to apply to Jesus, to ask him to save us by his blood. We're to put all our eggs in one basket. We're to trust him wholly, put our whole faith in Jesus only. Because what can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can cleanse us from within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Faith is faith in Jesus alone. She's a marvellous demonstration of that. Secondly, her faith came by hearing. Verse 25, we simply read she'd heard about him. We don't know who from. But somebody spoke to her about Jesus of Nazareth. His power, his miracles, his claim. And it was enough for her. And how does faith in the Lord Jesus Christ of salvation come about? Well, Paul says to the Romans, this is how faith comes today. It comes from the hearing and the hearing by the word of God. True, genuine, authentic faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we should be speaking and preaching and inviting people to the carol service where it will be preached so that they might hear because faith comes through hearing. Hearing. Third thing about her faith, it's a total commitment. She shows that in verse 25, where in a very violent word, she falls at his feet. I kind of picture it as a wholehearted collapse. She's not kind of reservedly holding anything back just in case it's not going to work. She just throws herself entirely at Jesus. I mean, if he doesn't catch her, as it were, then it's all been in vain. She throws everything at him. And that's what true faith is. The whole of us looks to the whole of Christ and we lean upon him such that if he doesn't catch us, we fall. True faith isn't to be reserved or hesitant. He's worthy of our all. We trust him. Fourthly, her faith is persistent and desperate. She's one of these lovely examples, isn't she, in the scriptures of somebody who will not take the answer no from Jesus. 
I'll never forget one of the first sermons I ever preached. It was terrible, but never mind. It was about Bartimaeus. And my text was, forgive me, all the more. And it was just the fact that, you know, he was put off and he was put off and he was put off. But the heart of faith just cried out, all the more and all the more and all the more. And she's like that, isn't she? She just keeps asking and begging and beseeching. Mark only records the fifth stage of the encounter. He doesn't record stages one, two, three, four, which you'll find in Matthew chapter 15. She goes to Jesus, he answers her not a word. Hmm, three left. His disciples urged him to send her away because she cries out after us. Ooh, not looking very promising. Stage three. He answered, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm. Stage four. She then came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And it's then that Mark and Matthew combine in the fifth stage where he says, let the children be filled first. It's all a test of her faith. She's like the persistent widow in the parable. She's like Bartimaeus. She's very much the true Israelite who's like the female Jacob wrestling with God. And this faith which persists and this faith which begs and this faith which is earnest is to characterise our faith and our praying. Not least in salvation for ourselves if we're not yet a Christian and for others. I mean, we could not be given more encouragement could we to ask and to seek and to knock and to ask and to seek and to knock and to ask and to seek and to knock to the loving Heavenly Father who knows how to give good gifts to his children. Fifthly, her faith is unworthy but hungry. You see, Jesus, in speaking about the dogs and the crumbs, really is telling her a parable. And she responds to the parable, accepting that the children, the Jews, should be fed first. She has no quibble with that. She's got a great humility in her heart, hasn't she? But her claim is her need, and the object to which she alone looks is Jesus. And so she persists. She knows she's unworthy, but she's hungry. And she knows that Jesus only can feed that hunger. It's said of this woman that of all the people in Mark, she has the most against her from a Jewish perspective. No credits, as it were, to her name. But she's the one who accepts she has an unclean heart, not because she's a woman and not because she's a Gentile. Being a Gentile isn't a barrier to faith. She's hungry even for crumbs. She doesn't mind if other people have massive nuggets. She doesn't have crumbs. She's a link between the feeding of the 5,000 to Jews and the 4,000 to Greeks. She's satisfied with crumbs if they come from the Saviour's table because she trusts in the surplus of Jesus. His superabundance is enough for her. Others may be first, but there'll be something for her, and that's what she wants. She trusts his superabundance. And in salvation, we are unworthy to be saved. But I hope you enjoyed singing the words, but hungry for your blessing. Hungry for your blessing. Hungry to be saved if you're not yet saved. Hungry to be right with God once and for all. Hungry to know that Jesus Christ is a living reality to you. I was reading again this afternoon that book by or Festo Kilinjeri, the um, Ugandan evangelist who worked with African Enterprise. I'd always thought it was him who on the day of his conversion said, not three hours ago Jesus Christ became a living reality to me. But it wasn't him. It was another man called Festo who said that to Festo just before he was converted. What a statement, though. Not three hours since Jesus Christ became a living reality to me. And Stuart Olliott at the recent Reformation Revival conference said, and, I, and I'm with him, he said, my contention is that I might be wrong. He said, but I, I worry that for the vast majority of evangelical Christians, Jesus isn't very real. 
Jesus isn't very real. And Festo was told, Jesus Christ became to me not three hours ago a living reality. Hungry for that blessing. Hungry to be saved. Hungry that others would be set free too. We're looking at her faith. We said, number one, it's in Jesus alone. It comes by hearing. It's a total commitment, a complete collapse onto Jesus. It's persistent and desperate. It's unworthy but hungry. And lastly, she truly heard, you know. Jesus said, didn't he, last time we looked, verses 14 and 16, let everyone hear and understand. Let he who has ears understand. When he tells the parables at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, let he who has ears understand what the Spirit says. She understood. It said of her, she's the first character in Mark's Gospel to understand a parable. She understands what Jesus of Nazareth is saying to her. She hears inwardly with an ear. And so she meets, contends and struggles with the Lord Jesus Christ. And she overcomes taking Jesus at his word. And you've heard too, haven't you? I've heard we're to take Jesus at his word. And our concern must be that others will too. (coughs) That others will really hear and take him at his word word. She's an unlikely character in a dark background with an unexpected but great according to Jesus faith and just to finish off her daughter finds freedom in verse 28 Jesus sends her home with assurance for this saying Jesus says go your way the demon's gone out of your daughter And when she got home, she found the demon gone and the daughter lying on the bed. Matthew says, let it be as you desire. But it was as she desired. Jesus cast out the demon. The daughter found freedom. Can you imagine what that must have looked like for the mum and felt like for the girl? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Life-changing and joyful. And so is finding freedom in Christ from our sins and from the grave and from Satan and from hell. It's a wonderful thing to know Christ, to have your sins forgiven, to be at peace with God once and for all, to know that your way is marked out and one day you will see him and be like him in glory. To find this glorious freedom that is only found in Jesus Christ. So finally... There's good news, isn't there? Of cleansing from sin. Of being set free from the dominion of darkness, from misery and death. And that good news is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for our sins and rose from the grave. And it really is good news for all, for you, for me. So if you haven't turned and believed, then his arms of love are open to you this evening. Please come Turn from your sin, unbelief, claimed goodness, and trust Christ. Exercise faith in Christ alone. The faith that comes from hearing. The faith that's a a total commitment. That will be persistent and, and desperate, unworthy, yet ever hungry. Let he who has ears hear. The good news is for all, believer, let's all be aware of our prejudices. I have a horrible feeling this will backfire on me sometime during the week. When I catch myself looking at someone or thinking of someone, thinking, well, you're not even listening on Sunday night, you Pharisee. Beware of our prejudices. It's for all. Be great to see so-and-so and so-and-so here next Sunday. Believer, let's rehearse and live out the joyful freedom we found in Christ. 
Freedom from the misery and uncleanness of sin. Freedom from the dominion of darkness. Freedom from condemnation. Freedom not just from but to. Freedom to know him and love him and enjoy him and know the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of his love for us. It is for freedom that Christ Jesus has set us free. And conscious that this daughter came to know freedom through the prayers of her mother. And I end with this. Let's seek to live clean and blameless lives which adorn the doctrine. Lives which are lives of love. They'll know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. So let's live holy and blameless and loving lives. Let's be ready to give an account for the hope that we have within us. To those in darkness that they'd hear. Let's pray the Lord of the harvest would send out proclaimers of the good news. If we'd be helped to use the material like Operation World so that we can pray for the salvation of the lost in the four corners of the world, then do so. But let's beseech God in that faith which is in Christ alone, which is persistent, which admits our unworthiness and yet is hungry, and ask that others would be set free from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. And it might simply start with 